Pseudofossils, new evidence. First, I should give uh, a little background for the new evidence, um, and I'm going to talk about early pseudofossils. Um, the uh, uh, J. William uh, Shope wrote a book called Cradle of Life, The Discovery of Earth's Earliest Fossils. And we're going to pay particular attention to pages 291 to 299, although we'll pay attention to other areas as well some. Um, in that uh, passage, uh, uh, Dr. Shob talks about Dr. Johann Bartholomew Adam Berenger, who lived between 1667 and 1740. He was a very brilliant man. He's a PhD and an MD, and he's a professor at the University of Würzburg, Germany. And uh, in fact, uh, he uh, pretty much ran the medicine department there. Uh, he, uh, in his spare time, he dabbled in fossils, which were a relatively new uh, interest for people. And uh, he employed diggers to look in areas where there were fossils, and uh, diggers started coming up with some very interesting fossils. And I'm going to show you a few of them. Here's one. Fossil of a bird. Pretty good fossil, actually. Um, and um, here's some more that he collected and put into a book. Um, you can see, uh, you know, beetles, lizards or salamanders, it's not clear which, some pretty wild creatures, S centipede, scorpion. Um, How did they get a fossil spider's web? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, and he found uh, a couple of other fossils that are kind of interesting, including a sun. <laughs> and a star, a shooting star, it looks like. Uh, uh, and, um, well, towards, towards the end, he's, he even found the name of God in his fossils. Uh, the other ones are not quite as clear, but here you can clearly see Y-H-W-H in Hebrew. Um, he, there were several theories about fossils at this point, and uh, uh, one of them was that these were sports of nature. Mm, he didn't think that was the right answer. One of them was that, um, that these were seeds that had gone down and germinated. And you have to keep in mind that this is you know, around 1700, so not as much was known about how animals reproduced and so forth. And, uh, uh, but he looked at that and he said, that's not probably it. And uh, one of them was that they were living creatures. And he says, well, my stuff is probably not the result of living creatures. Uh, and there were several other theories, including a theory that this was done by ancient pagans. And he said, you know, that actually would be uh, the best theory except for one thing. The ancient pagans wouldn't use the name of God. So um, he didn't know exactly what to make of it, but he thought that these were really impressive fossils. Well, as it turned out, the fossils were part of an elaborate hoax cooked up by Herr J. Ignaz Roderick, professor of geography, algebra, and analysis, the Honorable Georg von Eckhart, who's privy counselor and librarian to the court and to the university, and Baron von Hoff. Uh, when um, Beringer realized what was happening 
and people started making fun of him for having been taken in by a hoax. Um, and people started saying that he had planted these himself. He demanded a trial, and at the trial, the judicial hearing, uh, it came out that his digger confessed that it was not Berenger, it was these other three guys, one of whom died, one of whom moved away, and one of whom was kind of um, wound up eating a bit of crow. Um, and they were known as Lugensteine, which um, is, according to the book, is translated lying stones, which is probably a good description of them. Um, that's a case of pseudofossils. Now, um, Schoep goes on to talk about, uh, in 1725, Johann Jacob uh, Scheuchter, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, discovered a fossil that he thought was of an ancient man, which um, with further exposure turned out to be a giant salamander. Uh, what Scheuchter saw at first was this, and if you kind of imagine, you can kind of make eye holes out of this, and uh, there's, uh, the teeth are all gone and there's no jaw and there's a spinal column. And, uh, well, with a little further uncovering, one finds uh, some short limbs, which obviously don't co correspond to those of a man. And so uh, it's been determined that they're actually salamanders that are close to this size that uh, would form very good candidates for that. And what you're looking at is the salamander looking up rather than man looking at you. Um, and um, the reason I introduced that, although that's not a pseudofossil in the strict sense, is because in this passage, uh, Schoep is going to mention Scheutzer, uh, however that's pronounced. Um, and he said, yet who are we to sit smugly in judge to smugly sit in judgment? It is, of course, true no knowledge has grown immeasurably since the days of Beringer and Scheutzer, but it is well to remember that the human side of sciences largely stayed the same. Like those old time scientists, that should be plural and that's my mistake, we carry out our daily work saddled with ideas that we have been taught are true and struggle just as they did to make lasting contributions. And we are probably no more immune than they from the heady pull of a major breakthrough or even the urge to shoehorn fits, finds to fit prevailing views. Moreover, though, it is now harder to be fooled, though it is now harder to be fooled since so much more is known, it's a sure bet that some of what passes as known today will eventually turn to dust. Still, we can take heart, for Beringer and Scheutzer show that even when human foibles sidetrack the search for knowledge, the path will be regained. We can only wonder what the scholars of the year 2250 will think of us. But uh, one thing is certain, by then our most glaring blunders will have long since been cast aside. Well, who is this Bill Schoep? Well, he participated in the preparation of the first published report of fossils in the Gunflint Church, which is about 1.8 billion years old, according to the standard chronology. And um, a Gunflint, of course, is a reference to the old flintlock guns, where you had to have uh, a flint in order to spark the powder in order to go down into the barrel. Uh, and I guess this chert is particularly useful for that kind of thing. Um, but it turns out that there were a number of fossils found in it, and of course 1.8 billion years old, it was older than any known um, uh, any known fossil at that time. And um, uh, Interestingly, uh, he got involved in that during his sophomore year in college, uh, doing an honors thesis, and wound up working for 
the guy at Harvard who actually discovered that there were fossils there. And there's a little cloak and dagger stuff that goes in, that the book explains as to how when they were almost scooped by somebody else who had read their paper and figured out where it was, uh, that they managed to wind up uh, publishing first anyway, although Shope didn't have his name on that particular paper. So he's been interested in uh, microbes in the, uh, in the Precambrian for a long time. And he actually published the first reports on fossils in the apex chart, which is 3.465 plus or minus 0 0.005 billion years ago by the standard chronology. And um, which means that he has discovered the oldest known living things. Um, and here's a, a picture of some of the, uh, uh, some of the things in the apex uh, chert. And I mean, you can see that, yeah, you know, they look like they could pass for, for uh, uh, some kind of multicellular chain. Now, how do we know the fossils in the apex chert are that old? Uh, or more precisely, what I should have said is how, how do we know that they're real? and not just uh, pseudofossils. Well, according to Schoep, the biologic origin of claimed Archaean fossils can be accepted if they are, one, made up of coleorganic matter, two, complex enough in cellular structure to rule out possible non-biologic sources, and three, represented by numerous specimens. If one fossil can be preserved, others should too. So there should be multiple fossils. These are his criteria. Like younger fossils and living microbes, they also should be part of a once living species population with its gene-based range of differences among the members. They should not look exactly alike. They should, five, they should inhabit a living, livable environment. Six, they should grow and reproduce by biologic ways of cell division. And seven, if photosynthetic, they should exhibit the carbon isotopic signature of photosynthesis. And photosynthesis, uh, uh, especially using the Rubisco enzyme, uh, it's picky and it likes to use carbon-12 instead of carbon-13. And so you see a drop in the percentage of carbon-13 in, in the carbon. So if you've, if you've got stuff that has the same carbon 12 to carbon 13 ratios, everything else, you would say, well, that's probably not residuals of, um, of uh, photosynthetic bacteria. The 11 types of fossils in the apex chart meet these tests. According to Shope, they are, one, composed of dark brown to nearly opaque, carbonized, coley, organic matter, um, the dictation thing capitalized carbonized and I didn't realize it. Uh, two, unlike non-biologic structures and much more complicated, sinuous fossil filaments made up of cylinder, box, disc, or barrel-shaped body cells and flat rounded muffin or cone-shaped end cells. And three, they're known from a large number of specimens, nearly 1,900 cells measured in some 200 individuals. So this is we got lots of cells that don't look like non-biologic stuff. Moreover, the apex species are each made up for are each made up of members that very that should be very a r y slightly in size and shape, like the individuals in species of younger microbial fossils and living microorganisms. Five were bottom dwellings, shielded from harmful U V light by overlying water and thick surrounding mucilage. Mucilage. Uh, six grew and reproduced by the same type of simple cell divisions as living cyanobacteria and other microbes shown by preserved partially divided cells. Uh, it should be cells. 
and seven are present in a rock together with coli organic debris that by its chemical makeup, its carbon isotopic composition, is certain to have been produced by photosynthesis, as we will see in chapter six. And in chapter six, he has a whole um, section on that drop in the carbon-13 uh, concentration in these uh, organisms. Well, so we now have new data. Um, and uh, I put the website up there. The new data comes from Science News and or, or is reported in Science News and it gives you a good overview of what's going on uh, from the standard per perspective. And it's called Oldest, Con uh, Oldest Fossils Controversy Resolved. And uh, according to this new analysis of world famous 3.46 billion year old rocks is set to finally resolve a long running evolutionary controversy. The new research shows that structure once thought to be Earth's oldest microfossils do not compare with younger fossil candidates, but have instead the character of peculiarly shaped minerals. So Shope is wrong. In other words, what he was pointing out about the gentleman in 1700 is actually true of him as well. At least that's what we're being told. And uh, the story goes, new analysis of world famous 3.46 billion year old rocks by researchers from the University of Bristol, the University of Oxford, and the University of Western Australia is set to finally resolve a long-running evolutionary controversy. The new research published this week in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences showed that structures once thought to be Earth's oldest microfossils do not compare with younger fossil candidates but have instead the character of peculiarly shaped minerals. In 1993, U.S. scientist Bill Shelf described tiny carbon-rich filaments within the 3.46 billion year old apex chert fine-grained sedimentary rock from the Pilbara region of Western Australia, which he likened to certain forms of bacteria, including cyanobacteria. These apex chert microfossils between 0 0.5 and, 2 and 20 micrometers wide soon became enshrined in textbooks, museum displays, popular science books, and online reference guides as the earliest evidence for life on Earth. In other words, this until this year was the truth. In 1996, these structures were even used to test and help refute the case against, I'm sure that should read, uh, help produce the case or help refute the case for microfossils in the Martian meteorite ALH 84001. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, Shope has a section on the Martian meteorites. He took the con or the against case uh, at a uh, at the press conference that announced the uh, that there was life on the Martian meteorites, and his arguments eventually have won. Um, Nobody considers, a, or very few people at least, consider the Martian meteorite to actually have life uh, or traces of life in it. Even so, coming back to the apex chert, their curious color and complexity gave rise to some early questions. Gravest, gravest doubts emerged in 2002 when a team led by Oxford's Professor Martin Brazier, co-author of this current study, revealed that the host rock was not part of a simple sedimentary unit, but rather came from a complex high temperature hydroth hydrothermal vein with evidence for multiple episodes of subsurface fluid flow over a long time. His team advanced an alternative hypothesis stating that these curious structures were not true microfossils, but pseudofossils formed by the redistribution of carbon around mineral grains during these hydrothermal events. Although other research teams have since supported the hydrothermal context of Professor Brazier, 
The apex microfossil debate has remained hard to resolve because scientific instrumentation has only recently reached the level of resolution needed to map both chemical composition and morphology of these microfossils at the submicrometer scale. Now Dr. David Wasey, I want you to keep in mind Brazier and Wasey because we're going to see them again. Um, a Marie Curie fellow in Bristol's School of Earth Sciences in collaboration with the late Professor Brazier, who sounds like he died before this project was completed, has come up with new high spatial resolution data that clearly demonstrates that the apex chert microfossils comprise stacks of plate-like clay minerals arranged into branched and tapered worm-like chains. Carbon was then absorbed onto the edges of these minerals during the circulation of hydrothermal fluids, giving a false impression of carbon-rich cell-like walls. And if the carbon originally came from Rubisco-type organisms, it might very well look like it came from Rubisco-type organisms, but not from these particular ones. So you can see that criterion 7 is perhaps necessary but not sufficient. Dr. Wasey and team used transmission electron microscopy to examine ultra-thin slices of microfossil candidates to build up nanoscale maps of their size, shape, mineral chemistry, and distribution of carbon. Dr. Wasey said, it soon became clear that the distribution of carbon was unlike anything seen in authentic microfossils. Presumably meaning the gunflint shirt as a kind of a, a, a type case. A false appearance of cellular compartments is given by multiple plates of clay minerals having a chemistry entirely compatible with a high temperature hydrothermal setting. Quote, we studied a range of authentic microfossils using the same transmission electron microscopy technique, and in all cases, these re reveal coherent, rounded envelopes of carbon having dimensions consistent with their origin from cell walls and sheaths. At high spatial uh, resolution, the apex microfossils lack all evidence for co coherent, rounded walls. Instead, they have a complex, incoherent, spiky morphology, evidently formed by filaments of clay crystals coated with iron and carbon. So if the collection of carbon around whatever it is is smooth enough, then that's an argument for it being biologic in origin to begin with. If it's not smooth enough, then it's not biologic. Before his death, Professor Brassier commented, this research should at long last provide a closing chapter for the apex microfossil debate. Such discussions have encouraged us to refine both the questions and the and techniques needed to search for life remote in time and space, including signals from Mars or beyond. It is hoped the textbooks and websites will now focus upon recent and more robust discoveries of microfossils of a similar age from Western Australia, also examined by us in the same article. So we're going to forget about the apex and we're going to look at the more recent ones. Let's take a look at that. Um, the article that this is all taken from is uh, Brazier, Antcliff, Saunders, and Wasey. And Brazier and Wasey you've heard from already. Uh, changing the picture of Earth's earliest fossils, 3.5 to 1.9 uh, gigana, a billion years ago with new approaches and new discoveries. And it is available on the internet. And um, we'll look at the abstract. New analytical approaches and discoveries are demanding fresh thinking about the early fossil record. The 1.88, so you could round it off to 1.9 if you wanted. Uh, um, billion-year-old Gunflint Church provides an important sh benchmark for the analysis of early fossil preser preservation. High-resolution analysis of Gunflintia shows that my microtephonomy can help to resolve long-standing paleobiological questions. Novel 3D nanoscale reconstructions of the most ancient complex fossil, Eosphera, reveal features hitherto unmatched in any crown group microbe. Let me translate that last sentence. 
What it says is Eosphera doesn't look like anything we've seen that lives. Uh, while Eosphera may preserve a symbiotic consortium, a stronger conclusion is that multicellular morphospace was differently occupied in the Paleoproterozoic. Let me translate that again. Um, it's possible Eosphera is actually two organisms glommed together, but uh, they're saying it's more probable that it's one type of organism that has differentiated tissue. And uh, the multicellular morphous space is basically what, um, uh, what living organisms look like. And this is just a little bit different from everything else. The 3.46 billion year old apex chert provides a test bed for claims of biogenicity of cell like structures. Mapping focused. Map mapping plus focused ion beam milling combined with transmission electron microscopy data demonstrate that microfossil-like taxa, including species of Archaeoskeletoriopsis and uh, primaviphylum, are pseudofossils formed from vermiform phyllosilicate grains during hydrothermal alteration events. So he's looked at the gunflint chert, he's looking at the apex chert, and then he looks at the Strelly pool formation. This 3.43 billion year old formation shows that plausible early fossil candidates are turning up in unexpected environmental settings. Our data reveal how cellular clusters of unexpectedly large coxoid and tubular sheath-like envelopes were trapped between sand grains and entombed within coatings of dripstone, beaked rock, silica, cement. These fossils come from Earth's earliest known intertidal to supertidal shoreline deposit, accumulated under aerated but oxygen-poor condition. Now, I want you to notice something. Um, uh, the apex chert is 3.46 billion years old. The Strelly pool formation is 3.43 billion years old. If this is genuine, and the apex chert is not, then this is the oldest living thing, or the oldest true fossil. So keep that thought in mind in the back of your head as we go through this. How good is the earliest fossil record? How can we best measure and analyze it? These questions matter because of the vast duration of Precambrian time, about 4.55 to 0.54 billion years, which spans nearly 90% of Earth's history and contains most of the major evolutionary transformations in the history of life. There is a pressing need for reliable Precambrian fossil remains to help decode the emergence of complex life in terms of pattern, rate, and process. I'm going to skip over a few paragraphs because I'm not going to go over everything. Um, here is some stuff from the Gunflint chert. You will notice that it's nice, smooth cell walls. Nice, smooth cell walls. Nice, smooth cell walls. Uh, here is the Stradley pool. Nice, smooth cell walls. And here is the apex chert. And um, this one is selected from inside, which has kind of all kinds of stuff going through it. This one, um, I think that this is supposed to be going through here, but boy, you'd sure have a hard time figuring out where those cell walls were. Well, I don't know, maybe these aren't quite as smooth as they say, but whatever. And um, here's some more shots of the same kind of thing. This is the cell wall here. And you can see smooth, well, sort of smooth if you talk yourself into it. And um, this is the same thing on the, uh, under a larger magnification so you can perhaps see better. And here again, 
this is where the cell wall is supposed to be. Yeah, um, if you're having trouble seeing it, I, I'm having trouble seeing all of it too, so don't, don't feel bad. Um, the gunflint chart, new analytical techniques. The gunflint chart provides a test case for the value of modern analytical techniques. Such techniques include laser Raman spec uh, microspectroscopy, secondary ion mass spectroscopy, SIMS, time of flight, and nano as well. Basically, um, they're shooting ions at something, and with the ions that pop back out, they're finding out what kind of ions they are, doing mass, spectro mass spectroscopy on those ions. Focused iron, iron beam milling combined with transmission electron microscopy, that's uh, basically shooting ions at uh, what you're doing and carving off a little bit of it and hopefully you're seeing more uh, in the transmission electron microscopy than you would have otherwise. Um, and synchrotron radiation, that's very high potency uh, uh, x-rays and uh, instead of being just kind of general x-rays they're all of approximately the same uh, wavelength, um, plus confocal laser scanning microscopy. That's um, using lasers and scanning the thing with them. Um, where appropriately applied, such techniques allow for 3D mapping of morphology and even the mapping of metabolic pathways at nanoscales. Moving on. Small tubular filaments of gunflinty are abundant within this deposit. This is the gunflint deposit that we're talking about now. Um, and were originally compared with os oscillation cyanobacteria owing to the presence of cell-like septation. Later work, however, suggested that much if not all of the septation could have arisen from the decay of non-septate tubular sheaths. So when you see those septate, they really aren't there. Now, we're being told to see what we see, and we're being told that what we think we see, we don't really see. Um, fresh thin sections throughout these traumatolytic carbonaceous cherts revealed numerous gunflintia specimens, seemingly provided with cell-like septations. Uh, FIB CSEM, reconstruction of specimens replicated by pyrite, however, show no such features nor do specimens wholly preserved in carbonaceous matter. And those are in the supplementary material. Um, indeed, the septate appearance arises as a decay artifact. In gunflintia, this may have been the result of saprophytic activity and decomposition, uh, decomposition hinted at by the presence of closely associated rounded cell-like bodies of possible heterotrophs. So there's things that could be decay-producing bacteria there, or the remains of them. Remarkable features of Eosphere raise questions about the lack of comparable forms in the living microbial world. This is in Gunflintia, remember. Comparisons to the extant chlorophyte of uh, Volvox are problematic because that taxon does not display an inner sphere. This leaves three possible hypotheses. Eosphere was a member of an extant clade, that means something that we already know about, such as cyanobacteria, for which the op occupation of multicellular morphous space has changed with time. They used to look different from what they do now. At 1.88 giga year in a, and in an ecosystem without even eukaryotic algae, the adaptive lang uh, landscape for multicellularity would have been different. Um, there was more... Uh, there was advantages to having a different form. Exactly what advantages are being kind of elided. Um, hence, the theoretical morphous space may have been differently occupied. It may have looked different from what it does now. <coughs> Two, Eosphere was a member of an extinct clade, a, a sister or a stem to a modern clade that occupied a previously unknown region of multicellular morphospace. 
Three, Isferia uniquely preserves a symbiotic association between two different kinds of cells, a single large whole cell preserved as the outer sphere, the cell wall, plus an inner sphere, for example, an endocyst with an ex existment opening, and multiple small endosymbionts preserved as internal and external tubercles, or cell membranes. For instance, Eosferia could represent a phagocytic cell playing host to small cyanobacterial cells arranged around the inner margins of the host cell membrane. Such a hypothesis needs testing, but it could help explain why Eosferia is not found much earlier or indeed much later in the fossil record. It's rather unique. And here's some light uh, microscopy uh, photos, and you can see there's a rounded cell wall, and there's a kind of an inner and an outer cell, and then there's these little blobs here, which if you use your imagination could be um, other cells either cells of something else or, or cells of the creature itself. And um, these are uh, using scanning electron microscopy and so forth. Um, this particular one you'll probably notice forms the background of our slides. I'm going to brighten it up a little bit for you a little bit. Um, and um, you can see that there are some there's an inner cell and then there's the outer cell that goes with it and there's some different scanning <coughs> techniques that produce a slightly different image. It's very Tyleri therefore raises questions like those now arising elsewhere in the early micro macrofossil record including Ediacaran fossils such as Charnia, bizarre forms unmatched by the modern biosphere. Once compared with extant Cnidarian sea pens, Charnia is now thought to be somewhat wholly distinct, largely restricted to a specific time period and forming part of an extinct range of morph group having a distinct pattern of growth. That said, such enigmatic forms must still have a, clause, a closest living modern relative even if they cannot be placed directly within a modern crown group. There has to be some connection with other life. The extension of such arguments to the Precambrian microfossil record, therefore, demonstrates the extraordinary potential of the early fossil record to expand known biodiversity. The Apex chart, now we're going to test for biogenicity. Context is crucial to test for biogenicity. We have therefore mapped the context for these candidate microfossils at kilometer to micrometer scales and shown that they came not from a waved watch beach or stream but from a hydrothermally influenced subsurface vein system some 100 meters below the stratiform apex chert. So the apex chert is actually uh, not deposited by standard uh, 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 ocean waves kind of thing. It's more of a, more coming from some kind of a, a spring, an underground spring that's uh, coming up into the uh, water and presumably a hot spring. Our initial mapping of the microfossils argued that they come from within a succession of carbonaceous and metalliferous hydrobrushia fabrics. This has been supported by further research. The holotypes and paratypes were also examined and the populations mapped, leading to the conclusion that many of the microfossil-like structures are indistinguishable from associated mineral growths. Separate studies have reported further microfossil artifacts from the apex chert, but those objects are not carbonaceous in nature, and their directed relevance to the interpretation of the apex holotypes have, has been questioned. And um, they go on to say, carbon distribution in apex micro microfossils is therefore not comparable to with true cellular morphology. Our non-biological formation model consistent with multiple fluid flow events is, one, hydration of mica flakes abundant in the country rock during widespread hyper hydrothermal activity resulting in vermiculite-like uh, phyllosilicate formation. 
Um, that's a mineral that microscopically looks a little bit like worms, and that's why it's called vermiculite. Um, two, continued heating plus rapid expulsion of water from the phyllosilicate crystal lattices causing exfoliation, that is, accordion-like expansion at right angles to the cleavage plane, and creating the initial uh, vermiform or uh, worm-like morphological expression of microfossil-like artifacts, and three, adsorption of later hydrocarbons and locally additional iron onto the vermiculite mimicking cell walls. So you form these things out of mica and then you coat them with carbon. That's how, that's how it's done. Now, in the next section, we're going to talk about the Strelly Pool or Aronite. New environments and taponomic windows. Why, remember, this one is just a few million years younger than uh, the one they're criticizing. Why are a few cellular fossils found in rocks before 2.5 billion years ago? For decades, the main search image has been cyanobacteria-like assemblages as silicified algal mats and stromatolites. Have we been looking for fossils in the wrong places? And the implied answer is, of course, yes. We should be looking at uh, places like the 3.43 billion year old Strelly Pool Formation in Western Australia, which shows that early siliclastic sandstones, a hitherto unrecognized resource, can contain remarkable signals. Quartz sand at the base of this formation were deposited during the earliest stages of a mean, a marine transgression across Earth's oldest known unconformity surface. So the, the uh, Water is rising and it's producing beach sand which gradually gets submerged. Associated grains of rounded detrital pyrite show no signs of oxidation, nor do localized coatings of pyrite around rounded quartz grains. And the reference is to seven. We're going to look at seven in a minute. Organic matter trapped between grains near the base of the sand body is closely associated with this pyrite. And the significance of this is there must not be much oxygen at the time because otherwise the pyrite would start to be oxidized. Quartz pyrite and organic matter, matter were then rapidly coated and cemented by early diagenetic silica, chert, and overlain by a two to eight meter thick unit of quartzite. So. What's happening is that in between the sand grains, we're having these things deposited. Now, I'm going to skip over a few things, but I'm going to go down to that reference 70. Wacy, Kilburn, Saunders, Cliff, Brazier. Remember Wacy and Brazier? And their paper in National Geoscience was, or Nature Geoscience, was microfossils of sulfur metabolizing cells in 3.4 billion year old rocks of Western Australia. In other words, they're the people who discovered this stuff as near as I can tell. It's interesting that the paper says the authors declare no conflict of interest. Well, perhaps not financial, but um, anyway. So here's some of the stuff they're finding. Are you now thoroughly convinced that what they have in their stuff is um, actual cells in contrast to the apex chert? Their conclusion, while the quality of the early fossil record is much better than Darwin might ever have dared to imagine, we must still map out its limits and push back the boundaries using new techniques to test out ideas both old and new. Over the last decade, the criteria required for recognizing early life have been substantially refined, and many classic deposits have been re-examined. There are also new places to look in the fossil record, such as ours, so that environments long assumed to be barren of life may yet prove to be teeming. Both the vast genetic diversity and habitat range found within modern prokaryotes have also liberated scientists from searching for early fossil cyanobacteria along ancient wave-lapped shores. But 
I thought that theirs was an ancient wave lap shore too, but okay, well, any, anyway. As new techniques develop and as we look in more places provided with a better understanding of biogenicity criteria, the early fossil record has the potential to help to drive forward novel biologic thinking on major evolutionary questions on Earth and maybe beyond, such as Mars. Um, for what it's worth, if you're looking at pseudofossils, there's an excellent article by Ariel Roth that's available on the internet that I recommend that you read because it gives you a good background for uh, what you're looking at uh, or what you're looking for. My take on all this, it is fascinating to see how much of this field is driven by personality and ambition. Uh, Shope cut his teeth early on on the Gunflint chert and went on to make the Apex chert and of course is arguing because it makes him an important person. He, he admits this up front. Uh, of course the other guys don't admit it up front, at least in the literature I've read, although maybe 30 years from now they will. It'll be interesting to see. Um, Shope looks at the foolish gullibility of previous fossil experts. Um, these people look at Shope's gullibility. Uh, now Shope has proven to be wrong in spite of his supposedly careful analysis of the data. But this time we have it right. Anyway, that's my take. Now it's your turn. Ariel. It seems to me that there's one major weakness here that is not considered by the scientific community in this whole interpretation of early life in the fossil record. And that is the fact that <coughs> they're not considering the possibility that these could be later organisms that have infiltrated. Uh, the evidence for that is rather striking in that <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you go, for instance, uh, into the southeastern part of the United States and drill down into the sedimentary layers there, and you go down 600 feet, and you can find living algae there. Uh, this has tremendous implications for a microfossil record. Here we've got 600 feet down, and it's not just one isolated thing. They found many, several species of algae, other bacteria and so on, of course, are there algae, uh, protozoans, and so on. But the algae requires light to live. At least we used to think it did. Yeah, well, <laughs> I suppose you could say it did. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, what are these things doing there? They must have been infiltrated, uh, or they live on usually long lives, uh, uh, into this, uh, suggesting, you know, contamination. And, and we, Water goes in through these rocks, comes out of these rocks, carried all over the place. Uh, we have transport of all kinds of minerals in our rocks right now, as we know around here from contamination by uh, uh, tests, uh, pollutions we have, you know, into our water tables and so on. Uh, and organisms, uh, when a, a geologist finds a certain fossil at a certain level, uh, in a microscopic scale, he does not raise the question, hey, could this possibly be, have been transported in here? Uh, you have cracks, you have earthquakes, and so on that would facilitate this further. Uh, that question, and it's admitted in the scientific literature sometimes, rarely, hey, this question is not being asked. And I think it needs to be asked, 
uh, in connection with all of these studies. As I look at this image, I can't shake the thought that it looks to me very much like some kind of impressionist painting. Nice. Somebody just did a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and there you go, voila. Now, I, I suspect it's probably not that cross. But well, to be fair, I have enlarged the image beyond what it's supposed to. I, so I, some I of the so. some of the dullness of the uh, of the details are not um, are, are 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 due to the enlargement process and not necessarily to the the actual image. I I get it, but I I've looked at many EMs of living material. It doesn't. Yeah, but one point, uh, or three point, what is it, four billion years will really mess up your, the way things look. Yeah, the resolution. The problem is that if you can't really see what you've got, it's best not to claim that you've got something. Uh, instead of claiming all sorts of things and then not really knowing what you got. <laughs> I mean... They're basically ascribing everything to morphological patterns. Am I wrong here? Am I missing something? A and perhaps a little bit of mineral distribution or some such thing. Well, I'm, I'm curious because supposedly the minerals are supposed to be replacing some of the original stuff. And uh, it raises the question of whether they should replace... Um, the the cell membranes or not and 1.3 1.8 billion years let alone 3.4 billion years should really do a number on on uh, on the leftover cell walls i would think but that's just yes you, know. you wouldn't expect any kind of biomolecules a comment here and then another one back there yeah down here first um, Danilo just mentioned claims. People make claims, bogus claims, for a variety of reasons. You started out with a famous classic example of the amphibian, Homo diluvia testi, it was named, classified. Here. The the witness, the man, the witness to the flood. Exactly. I mean, talk about all the biases you could have were poured into this one fossil. Well, that took me back to southern Indiana about three decades ago when I was doing my library of science degree. I had the chance to visit uh, Pennsylvania uh, rock formations. There are a lot of coal there, and there's a lot of uh, also uh, cycles with uh, possible tidal cycles there in the rocks. Uh, I remember going to this one uh, one uh, formation that was south of Bloomington, Indiana, about an hour's drive. Big, big quarry. I mean, they've excavated a lot out of it. And I talked to one of the uh, the miners there. It's a strip mine, surface mine. And he said um, not too long before that, he had, or his crew had found a fossil salamander. Now, I always thought salamanders were, you know, six, eight, ten inches long. He said his fossil salamander was so big he could hardly lift it. He needed help lifting it, putting it in the bed of his pickup truck. It was four feet across. And so you can see how they would mislead, were misled. Schweitzer, um, that one must have been f at least four feet, and uh, so on. So... These false claims can be based on pseudo-fossils, as you pointed out, can be based on in misinterpretation, like um, even with uh, pollen in the Grand Canyon. Uh, I think there actually was pollen in the Precambrian rocks, but it was misinterpreted how and when it got there. So sometimes you can correctly 
identified the fossil, but you might misinterpret the whole process of how it came to be preserved. And then you actually have out, uh, occasions of outright fraud. And all of these are kind of in the same bailiwick or the same basket because they lead to false claims. And just this week, I spent a whole week at meetings in Keene, Texas, Southwestern Adventist. And uh, on Sunday before the meetings began, I thought, I want to revisit Paluxy River. The last time I was there, I was there with this gentleman and his wife probably. And um, I remember Robert Brown and all the geoscience staff, 1976, right? And at that time, it was summer drought. And we saw beautiful uh, dinosaur tracks and quotes, human tracks being exposed. Well, that's not only misinterpreted, but then you have the actual recarving of dinosaur tracks in limestone. And those were sold on the market for, for money. So uh, you have all those claims, and the whole process of science is to do its level best to undo a, an interpretation, if possible. Prove it wrong, and then kind of by virtue of default, it stands the test of time. And that's how science kind of works. Well, I'm passing the mic. So let me just clarify or comment one point, not clarify. Uh, I have seen the actual fossil Homo diluvia testi in the Netherlands. It's about three to four feet long at most. Okay. That, that's its size. I was wondering if we eliminate the contamination factor mentioned by Dr. Airy, what would be the more correct age of living creatures. And I'm especially thinking about uh, large creatures, not microscopic uh, ones. Well, that all depends on how much you trust radiometric dating and which radiometric dating you trust. If you go by the standard um, dating that's usually done by geologists, uh, you would you would put them you would put macroscopic creatures outside of the Ediacaran fauna. You'd put it at about uh, 500 and 40, 530, 520 million years back depending on which creature you're talking about. There's a few of them that, that go back a little further than that, but that's pretty much it. If you go by carbon-14 dating, you're probably looking at somewhere less than 50,000 years. So uh, you kind of, in, in, for, the, for the actual fossils that you can see, as opposed to look at under a microscope. Which one of those uh, methods is more reliable? Reliable. That depends on who you ask. If you ask me, I think carbon-14 <laughs> is more reliable, but uh, your mileage will vary. didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not that one doesn't understand, but this is so extreme that you have to think this is somebody's good imagination. Yeah. Well, the thing I think when I'm looking at all this is uh, I see um, I see people who obviously have several hundred dogs in the hunt, you know, so to speak. And um, I think that bias is how you look at stuff. I think you look at, oh, well, see, mine are nice, smooth. Well, they're not really nice, smooth, but they're smoother than the other guys. 
well, that's not saying very much, but what do you expect? And, and so it, it devolves into what you want to believe. And what you want to believe partly depends on your worldview, and it partly depends on whether it will make you famous or not. Uh, you know, that's why the kind of comment about uh, we declare no competing interests, well, except, <laughs> we right. except we want to be the ones who have discovered the oldest life. We want to be famous. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's like you know there there is this huge pressure, you know, not only to not only to fit it into the standard model more or less, but also to be the first. And you can see somebody who, you know, kind of puts everything into the article and never draws the conclusion that you know what. Now we will replace apex fossils as the oldest living things, and we'll get into the textbooks and all that stuff. There is a book over here in the library in the geoscience uh, building just across the street here, which about 300 Precambrian species are listed as pseudo-fossil or dubio fossils. Uh, pseudo fossils means, of course, fossil. Dubio fossils means that it's dubious, uh, and so on. Uh, a lot of these are stromatolites, and so on. And uh, but keep in mind that there are those areas of geology where uh, witchcraft and geology intersect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, th this tends to be one of those areas. <laughs> I think we had one comment back there, and <laughs> what just seems to me is these people are straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. Well, it, uh, yeah, there's a certain aspect of that, I think. Uh, you know, I guess one of the things that, that I hope people go away with is the idea that when the next article comes and it is trumpeted as we now have all this new knowledge that that has all these wonderful implications and perhaps some of them are uh, a little hard on, uh, on a biblical model, that maybe we don't abandon our b biblical model quite yet until we've had a little chance to look at things. That it's 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 a mistake to follow the latest fad of science because you know here's a fad that apparently if you believe the literature was there for what several decades got into all of the literature and we're just now discovering it isn't really true maybe those guys are too skeptical i don't know you know, I, I think that we need a little more solid basis. You know, people often say that evolution is, is as good a theory as gravity. Um, you know, I experience gravity all the time right now. I can't go back and find fossils a billion years old and test them. We're flying by the seat of our pants. And yes, we've got some very fancy pants to fly by, but they're still pants. You know, it is not that it is not that kind of science. And I, science is not science. And that's there is not one uniform thing, and you have to buy the whole package or none of it at all. And I think that's just uh, that's a major mistake that people make. And I think that the less we make it, the better off we'll be. And I'll let. Um, uh, I'll let you have the last word here. You have said it well, thank you.